his bass voice all week. I'm getting used to it now. I'm going to feel very squeaky when this goes away. All right, so uh, welcome to this session on change. I was just saying something to one of the people outside. It's kind of weird how the more you learn about something, the less you know about it. And it's kind of scary. Because um, I think every time you learn one more thing about something, you realize there's five more things that you don't know about it. <laughs> So as a beginner, you learn something new, you're like, now I know everything there is to know. And then the more you learn about it, the more stupid you feel. So I don't know anything about change. But I'm going to share a little bit of what I've learned so far. Um, and I'm Henrik, by the way. I'm from Sweden. And I'm very happy to be here in India. It's the first time in my life. So uh, I chose this title, Everybody Wants Change, but uh, nobody likes to be changed. Um, does that sound kind of familiar? Does anybody here have that this feeling? Uh, I'm inspired, I want to change things, right? But but how do I convince those people over there? <laughs> I want to change, it's just that those, those people over there. The purpose of this is to help you understand what you can do to, to trigger organizational change. In fact, it's not really organizational change, it's in fact any kind of change, right? And a lot of this is actually little tips and tricks that I've picked up. I'm not much of a theory, but little tips and tricks. And actually one model just to you know make it look a little bit theoretical. And um, well first, an exercise, right? An exercise. Are you ready? Yeah. Right. Change something on yourself. Right now. Yeah. I, I don't see a lot of brave changes. I see a little <laughs> <laughs> uh, dramatic. Yeah, yeah, I tried. I can't see it. So. Yeah, I don't see someone standing yeah, on the head or, you know, yeah. Yes, so someone did something really cool, put, put their phone in another pocket. That was <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was the warm up. Now change something on somebody else. Somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is this? Resistance. I'm seeing resistance. All right, so how many actually changed something on somebody else? I tried. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. It feels weird. And the changes tend to not stick. Right? I saw a lot of changes get undone the same second after the <laughs> So how do I convince people? Well, don't bother. Right? Just don't bother. Um, that, that attitude is, isn't effective. Um, I mean, who likes being convinced? Right? It's, it's, it's just, it's just not, not fun. And look at it more like change starts with you. You can, you can change yourself to a certain extent, although that's actually quite, quite hard in that. But it's something you can control yourself a little bit more, right? So if you can change your way of looking at the problem or the situation, that might inspire other people to change as well. That seems to be more effective, although I realize that it can sound a little bit weird. So I'll give you some examples. Right? Um, oh, by the way, I learned that this actually works, too, sometimes. Um, this is uh, Taka, Takao Oyobe-san, who is in Japan. He said that uh, after seeing this presentation, he went back to his team and he said, I changed myself, he told me. Uh, uh, after that, my team also changed. Oh, I don't remember what it changed exactly, but it worked. So I was very happy to see that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start with this. How can you get a six-year-old to clean his room? Ooh, that's hard. How many of you have kids? Yeah. How many of you are agile coaches? How many of you are evil coach dads or moms that experiment on your kids? <laughs> <laughs> so, Not kids, but family questions. Family, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm one of those, and sometimes experiments blow up, but sometimes they work. And this one worked amazingly well. Uh, so yeah, how to get a six-year-old to clean his room. Um, there, are, there are a number of bad strategies, right? Such as, uh, uh, you have to clean up your room now or else, right? <laughs> Doesn't work very well. Short-term solution. Or, uh, I'll give you ice cream if you <laughs> might work for a while, but you have to have a lot of ice cream. Um, look, I cleaned your room for you. I'm a servant leader. <laughs> I got that wrong. Even the best ideas can be misunderstood. And no, it's really back to you. What is my goal? Right? What is my goal, personally, for him cleaning his room? Right? I thought about that and. Is it actually because I care about his room? No, I don't live there. <laughs> oh, it's a house, <laughs> So, OK, 
okay, I want to teach him to take responsibility for his room. That, okay, that, that, maybe it's a bit more about that. Well, why, right? Why am I teaching? Well, so, so he enjoys keeping it clean by himself without being reminded, right? That's what I really want. But why? Well, because that saves time for me. <laughs> And because he learns a valuable skill for life, at least my son and I care about stuff like that, right? So it's kind of back, what's my motive for this, right? You've got to understand my motive, really. Um, so looking at that, I have to change my, my approach to this. Coach mode instead of authority mode. As a father, you're, I, mother, you're automatically kind of an authority, and that can be a disadvantage. You know, warp your mind, I'm not, I'm not authority, I'm, I'm coach. So what do coaches do? Well, coaches don't, coaches don't force people to do stuff, right? And you don't do the work of the client for them. Basic coaching. Okay, so now I'm going to present um, a little bit of, of, of a change model. It's kind of like a bastardization of a number of real change models. I've combined them, simplified it, and made it my own. Okay. It doesn't have a name. Um, what is the destination, right? What does that look like? Clean room, okay? Uh, you could ask him about that, right? What would it be like to, have, to, to be in a room that is really nice and clean? Do you remember last time your room was really nice and clean? Right. Yeah, what was that like? Right? Oh, yeah, I, I, I could find all my stuff easily. I wasn't losing my, my toys and, you know, felt better walking inside the room. Make, make that, make it, kind of describe what it's like on the other side and see if, if he agrees with that being a nice place. Because if he doesn't, if he says, I like my room to be a mess, then that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out, actually, yeah, he actually does like having a clean room. And then we look at the current situation. Right? So destination and the motive be either go to the current situation. How does your room feel right now to you? Like, oh, it doesn't feel very good. I can't find my stuff anywhere. I keep stepping on things. And the, my, my younger brother goes in and steals things. I don't know shit. Right. right. These are things that are needed. So, and the next one, uh, what is one thing that, 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 that you can do to make it a little bit cleaner, right? I offered him a process. I basically stole the getting things done uh, inbox cleaning process, which is, here, this, there's a thing here. What is that? Oh, it's a piece of leg. Oh, where does it live? Just that one thing. Uh, well, how about it lives here in this box? OK, so you, you know, put it there, right? Yeah. Done. Okay, but what's that? Oh, it's a piece of paper. Though. Where does that live? I don't want it. Okay, so where does it live? Oh, it lives in the box. And just, just, just ask him that question. What, what, you know, what is it? And do you want it? Where does it live? After, after a minute or two, there was this little spot on the floor that was empty. Wow, so it's empty right there. It's clean right there. So progress meter, right? <laughs> you can see that it's, something's happening. Um, so we just did this, and after a while, I just left. Because now he's just very concrete. I'm not cleaning the whole room. I'm just picking up one random thing, deciding where that one thing goes, putting it there, and then that's it. Feels very simple, but that, that's all he was doing. And you can see the progress of the room getting cleaner. I walked out, came back after an hour or two, and the room was beautifully clean. It's like, wow. And not only that, he was busy coaching his younger sister <laughs> to do the same. I was like, wow, amazing. It was showing off, you know, wouldn't you like your room to be as clean as mine? I mean, imagine if your room was as clean as mine. How would that feel? And how does it feel being here? Right? Kids are really good at pick, picking up coaching skills. But the interesting thing was that this kept working. So now he's nine years old and his room is still clean. You wouldn't believe that, would you? And it turned out to be repeatable. So I have four kids. Uh, now my, my oldest daughter is seven. It, it didn't work when she was five. But when she turned six, seven, it worked for her too. Although not as easily. She was tougher. But it actually went, it even backfired. Now I'm like, come on, son, dinner's ready. He's like, no, man, I'm still color sorting my socks. <laughs> so things, things can go a bit too far. But what, what this did, it caused a change in a, in, a, in a permanent way. It had a kid, which is quite interesting. And let's look at this model. Turns out that this is quite useful. Make sure that whoever is, is involved in this change agree on you know, what, what is the picture we're talking about. Maybe it's agile, right? For example, it's an agile concept, right? You want to work in agile. So, what does that mean to us? What is it like over there? We might start with a manifesto or start with an experience report or something, right? Just paint that picture. And then we've got to make sure that the people who are going to be involved, they actually want to be there, right? Is this where we want to be? Never mind how. Is this where we want to be, right? Just kind of paint that hypothetical picture. And then next is, well, you know, we have to agree on where are we right now, right? And in contrast that to where we want to be. Like, what is the difference between where we are now and agile? And then um, it's not enough. We need concrete steps. What are some really concrete things we can do to get not to get to here, but to get one step closer to here, right? And there's some way of finding out: Are we are we getting anywhere near? Because otherwise, we tend to lose steam after a while, right? We 
can't see that will make any difference. It could be things like uh, metric or simple. It could be subjective things. You know, how does it feel like something's worked now compared to last week? Things like that. It looks easy, right? <laughs> but as many of you know, and many of you here are, are change agents, it takes courage, right? It's hard. Because you're questioning the, 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 the status quo, right? And there's a quite realistic risk of resistance. Right? resistance. So I found that this model uh, is useful for understanding the nature of resistance when it happens, right? So I'm like, they don't see, it's not working. The agile transformation is not working. Why? You might think about, well, is it because I haven't communicated clearly what, what this is? Maybe there's different standards. People have misconceptions about what it is. I'm using Agile as an example, but think of any change you want to do, right? So maybe we don't have the same picture, or maybe we all have exactly the same picture, but there's people who don't want to be there, right? Maybe I'm going to lose control. I'm a project manager, and I want to have control with my people, and you're going to take that away from me. And that matters to me, right? So I know damn right what you mean by Agile, and I don't want to be there. It's important to understand the distinctions in these two, because if not, you're probably going to attack the problem in the wrong way. Or maybe we, we know we want to be there, but we know what, what it is, and we know we want to be there. We have a different picture of the current situation, right? The manager who always sits inside his office says we're already agile. Okay, so how can I help him see that we're not, right? For example. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, yeah, uh, you know, I, I know what it is. I want to be there. I know that we're not there, but it's impossible. I don't see any step. How am I going to get there, right? It's, it's not possible. So that can cause resistance, because like, why would we waste time solving something that can't be solved? Or maybe, you know, we get started, but we lose steam after a while because nobody sees that it's actually making any difference. And there's a ten tendency, there's like a muscle memory in that organization where we tend to just revert back to where we were unless there's energy pushing us somewhere. So, I never apply this model strictly, but it's, you know, I found it useful to have this thinking inside the back of my head. So I give that to you as a kind of a thinking tool. There is some resistance that is silly, that is unnecessary, like resistance for the wrong reason. So I'm going to give you some approaches for tackling that. One is the us and them problem. <laughs> so, yeah, how many inside here are us? <laughs> Do we have any them in here? Yeah, any them? Yeah, what does it feel like being them? Uh, I feel outside. You feel outside, right? Yeah. Yes, it's being them is it's not fun. Yeah, yeah if, if, if us and them work together every day, then gradually us and them just becomes us. So here's the thing. I've seen this so many times. It's funny. I'm sure many of you have too. So I've talked to developers. Hey, uh, so do you want to go agile, right? They're like, yeah, definitely. This is what we want to do. But you know, those managers won't, won't let us. Okay. Won't let us. Okay. So I wander over to the manager and say, so do you want to go agile after describing what it is? They're like, of course we do. This is what we want to do. But our customers won't let us, right? And then you can guess the rest of the story. <laughs> but the customer, if you want to go agile, this is what it means to you. I'm like, of course we do. This is how we've always wanted to work. The projects that I've seen that succeed, this is how we work. Although we didn't call it agile, we, just, but we work that way. Great. So should we do it? And all those developers, they, they, they don't want to. They can't manage it. They can't do it. Does this look familiar? So this is us and them, right? Yeah, well, I'm fine, but those, those over there. So there are some tricks to handle that. The best is to get everyone together in the room at the same time, if you can, right? And ask the same question. So this is what agile is, right? Uh, I'm showing you what it is. And I want to know if, you, if, you, if that's where you want to be. Right? Never mind how. And then quite often, surprisingly, everyone's like, yes. And then they look around and surprise. Whoa, that's the customer. He's saying yes to Everyone's like, OK. So we actually do want to go here. Great. We're halfway there already, just by agreeing that that's where you want to be. Right? Doesn't always work, but all these tricks I'm showing you are tricks that have worked amazingly well at least once. But of course, nothing works always. So I'm hoping at least some of them will be useful. Um, so now we start talking about how, right? So now we have a dialogue. If you can't get everyone together at once, you can capture the intent. You know, what are the project, man the product managers maybe, right? So shall we move in this interest? This is a real life example, um, by the way. Asked a bunch of product managers in a Swedish government organization. So, you know, this is agile. They're like, great. Um, so I asked them, is this where you want to be? And then they put marks on this sheet. Everybody put up, plus means yes. Minus means no. Question mark means I'm not sure right now. And to my amazement, every single person in the room put up plus, <coughs> yes. And I walked around with that to the people, developers and managers. They're like, what? It helps a lot. Statement on intent, just capture it somehow. All right, here's another trick. 
Um, I think it's called the art of the possible. I'm not sure. Um, but never, never mind what it's called. It's about changing your why can't you question to the do you want to question. Right? Uh, coaching voodoo. <laughs> Example, we can't release software every iteration, says Peter. We can't release software every iteration. So coach said, why can't you do that? That's the wrong question to ask, right? Because what am I doing right now? I am begging, begging, begging. I'm begging for resistance, right? I'm asking, why can't we do it? So he's likely to tell me exactly why we can't do it. Right? <laughs> it's better to ask, first of all, if you could, would you want to, right? So we separate the, do you want to from the how, right? If you could, would you want to? And then maybe the answer is, well, yes, you know, we can, but if we could, I would want to, right? And the next question is, well, well, what needs to happen to make it possible, right? Or if we just pretend that we succeeded, let's say, how, how did we do it? So in a way, it's a kind of manipulation, but it's really about framing the problem in the right way, right? So what would need to happen to make it possible? Now this person was full of reasons why it can't work is instead going to use all that information to think about what would need to happen to make it work, right? Very useful. Sometimes it's what you need to ask yourself, too. What if the answer for do you want to is simple no? If the answer is no, then you know, go to the next problem. <laughs> <laughs> don't convince people it's a waste of time. If they don't want to go where you want to go, you need to start thinking about your motives, right? Why should they want to go where I want to go? Why should they, right? I better find a reason or, or stop trying to change people. Right. So, um, Here is a very concrete technique that I've been using uh, at Spotify, which is a company that is changing very fast because they're growing very fast. And change is happening all over the place, right? <coughs> I found it quite useful to put up a board. This was used by all the coaches in the organization, about 10 coaches, and some of the people from HR, and some of the managers. We, we put up this board, which we call the improvement board. And uh, Spotify has about 600, 700 people spread across four cities. We had this physical board. Later on, we, we changed to an electronic board. But first, it looked like this. What's on there are improvement themes, right? We agreed on what are the high-level improvement themes for this organization. One was squad autonomy. We want our squads, which is our weird word for, for scrum team, to be able to put stuff into production on their own with no dependencies. So, of course, we're, we're not quite there yet. So um, we wrote this definition of awesome. Every improvement theme has a definition of awesome, which is kind of like, in a perfect world, like, it would work like this. Or how would we recognize a perfect world? And we put up all the characteristics. Well, the squads are never blocked on dependencies. They can put stuff into production anytime, right? For example. Just pretend that we will probably never get there. And that's okay. This is just a vision, right? We we'll start there, agree on the definition of awesome with some of the key people involved. And then, of course, we've got to make it concrete. So for each swim lane, which is one theme, is we make improvement stories. So improvement themes have a definition of awesome. But we don't expect to ever get there. It's just a direction. And then each improvement story is a concrete step, one thing we can do and get done, which will either take us in this direction or teach us something. It could be an experiment, teach us something, which will help us get in that direction. So in this case, it was a teach us something. We started doing surveys to find out, interviewing teams to find out what is getting in the way or what would they need to be able to put some production on their own. All kinds of stuff. In fact, the rest of my presentation is really about what kind of stuff might you put on one of these improvement stories, concrete things you can do. Right? And they're typically just a few days of work for, uh, for somebody. Um, now we're trying out a, a, a version of Trello. The, the tool doesn't matter too much. It's just about making it visible and forcing it to prioritize. You can't do everything at once. So we picked five improvement themes. Right? These are the five things. Which is actually too many, but yeah, there were um, And then what are the next stories that would take us in that direction? What are we doing right now and what's done? So that way we can be thinking about, well, OK, we've now done these two things. We're a little bit more autonomous than before what will be the next two or three stories, right? So just to focus the improvement efforts a little bit. Does that make sense? Improvement boards. You can use them at any level. You can use them inside your team as a retrospective tool or, or at, at the top level in the management team over an organization. Okay, so let's look at some sample actions, right? So now I'm just throwing techniques at you. You can choose which ones apply in your conference. Um, make today's pain visible. I'm assuming that you want to change something because there is a problem you want to get rid of. So make that problem visible, right? Uh, how could you do that? Well, boards like this are a typical classic solution. It can be in your team, or it can be across the whole product. Some of you were in my Lean from the Trenches section when we were talking, where I showed this big, big uh, uh, beast of a board. 
but what we saw there when it was, was a bottleneck in system tests, all this stuff here is stuck in system tests. Whoa, what's happening? Someone having fun back there? <laughs> I'm glad you're detaining yourself. <laughs> Wouldn't want people to fall asleep, would I? Um, so yeah, look, it, this is just visualizing the pain. It was like, ah, everybody knew about the problem, but making it visible made it more you know, tangible. Plus, we measured velocity. We just counted how many of these notes get into production or get, or get done, like really done, every week. And it turned out it was zero every week because they're all piling up here. So this creates a sense of urgency, right? Our velocity is zero, so it's piling up. Right? It doesn't solve the problem, but it visualizes our current situation, right? If that's what we're we need to do. Well, another classic is a burn-up chart. So I'm going to give an example. These are all real-life examples, by the way. I'm not making these up. And they're quite interesting, some of them. This was a project which had a fixed scope of 250 story points. We estimated each feature and story points, like is it big or small, add them all up, it's like 250, right? That was the scope. And there was a fixed time contract as well. Darn, right? So we, it was a big promise, it has to be done here by April, Q2. The project actually started the year before, so it's been going on for a while. So we have to get to here, 250, by this date. Okay, now we're visualizing the goal. And then we want to visualize the actual current situation. <coughs> actually, it's visualizing history. Um, after one sprint over here, they actually finished 10 points. And the next sprint afterwards, they finished another 10 points. We started measuring this, right? And hmm, <laughs> what is the likelihood of us getting this curve? <laughs> well, you know, we don't, I mean, it's like, okay, wishful thinking, right? It is more likely, just looking at the trend, that we'll end up somewhere here, which means that, you know, okay, April, Maybe April is okay, it's just the wrong year, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is visualizing the current situation in a way that cannot be misunderstood. Some people, most people, you know, pictures work. But if they're more like numbers people, you can just do that instead. Um, that, right? Two or three or thirty things left in the list. We finished ten for sprint. Do the math. Uh, and each sprint is two weeks long. Uh, it's, people have vacation sometimes, in Sweden at least. And then, you know, uh, over a year. Sometimes you don't have sub objective data. Sometimes you need subjective data. And this has turned out to be surprisingly powerful. We have some kind of a goal, right? It's always good to ask yourself, what is our definition of success for whatever, the, whatever we're doing right now, right? Agree on definition of success. It could be to reach a certain impact by a certain date or whatever, um, capture a new type of user group. Regardless of how you phrase our definition of success, you can, once you've done that, you can ask people, do you believe this is achievable? You can do an informal survey. You just walk around the hall and ask people. Scale one five. So yeah, scale like this, uh, certainly, or, or forget it, or somewhere in between. And then in this particular case, uh, when the data showed us that uh, forget it. This is a death march, right? Pretty much everyone I asked said one or two. It's a death march. We don't need any more data than that. People's gut feels amazingly powerful. So this caused all kind of change. Because people realized that we're on a death march. A very simple technique, actually. Here's another visualization technique. This was actually the most impact I've ever seen from one single picture. This specific picture, a company and for a long game company for a long time that had been trying to improve their process to get faster at building games. We tried all kinds of stuff. Nothing caused change to happen until we drew this picture. What we did was get a cross section of the company into the room and ask them what happens when we build a game? What are the steps involved? Turns out that a single game that's being built from idea to production goes through all these steps, gets stuck in all these queues, right? And there's all these handoffs. The red numbers are waste. Time is passing without that game being built at all. Six months right here, right? <laughs> Green is someone is doing work on this game. So we're just tracking the game. Turned out this was a typical game. Two years, right? Everybody knew it took about two years to get a game out the door. But what they didn't realize was it was actually about three months of work, right? Most of the time was just waiting. So this picture, just walking around with it, showing developers, showing managers, showing designers and product, they were like, what the hell? It was the biggest collective, oh shit, moment I've ever seen in a company. Why is that? Well, because everybody's focusing on their box here, right? Most people are inside their box, optimizing their box, and not noticing that what needs to be optimized is the space between the boxes, right? So this caused us to be able to make a dramatic organizational change and do Scrum and pull out feature teams, and pretty much get eight times faster without hiring more people. But the key to be able to do this was really just the realization that this is our current process, right? So yes, yeah, powerful. It doesn't always work. Sometimes we've drawn this picture and nothing happens, right? But it's a cheap thing to try. Mm -hmm. All right, so actions, concrete actions, right? That's what this is about, things you can do to help change happen. 
find out what people really care about. Right? Sometimes if you think you have the best idea in the world and no, nobody reacts to it, maybe you've misunderstood people's motives. Right? Here's a very concrete example. Suppose um, I, I want to get the team together. Right? They're spread out in different rooms, and that's you know, very unagile. I want to get them together. But nobody wants to do anything about it. They're like, well, this is the, our facilities are like this. We have rooms. right? We can't change that. We're not going to move to a new office. Right? So you know, get back to work, go back coding. Right? So it turns me, so okay, what, what drives, who do I need to recruit to get this change, right? <coughs> well, maybe we need to knock down some walls. I need to get office management in, right? There's money involved, right? Got to find out. And then I got to speak their language. So maybe what they really care about is money. And maybe it turns out that the thing we're building is going to earn us money. So reframe the problem, right? Uh, the team here estimates that their velocity will be 50% higher if we just sit together, right? Your gut feel, maybe previous experience, it's just asking but nobody can estimate it better than themselves. And uh, asking their product owner, he says, uh, this means we can release two months early. The math is quite easy, just look at it, right? You can get more stuff done, and get release earlier. And he can probably calculate the value of that, right? And then he can look at what is the cost of tearing down this wall so the team can sit together. And now we have a business case that people will start thinking, mm, right? Mm, right? Once again, it doesn't always work, but now we're at least trying to speak the, the right language, right? Making a business case, right? Here's a recommendation. Whenever we're talking about change, we tend to fall into this trap of thinking that the status quo is what we have, and here is someone's idea. And no, I don't like that idea, right? For whatever reason, it's not perfect. So therefore, we won't do that, and we'll keep the current idea. Maybe it's just fear, right? That the idea might not work. So that's why I don't want to do it, because then I'll, be, I'll look bad, right? So once again, change yourself. Reframe the problem. And this is a good trick. Um, Option A is actually status quo, right? Put that up on the board. Here's option A. Do nothing. Continue as today, right? That is just an option. And option B is this horrible idea that I just made up, right? It's actually sometimes a good idea to come up with a horrible idea. This is a bad idea, but I put it up there because that's another option, right? Um, so what other options can people come up with? And that might be, be, make people challenge, like Henry came up with this really stupid idea. I can do much better than that. How about this, right? getting people to come up with ideas. We're brainstorming. Because they realize that, wait a sec, if our only two options are continue like today, which we don't want to, or implement Henrik's horrible idea, ah, that's not good. Right? So now we're you know, getting ideas up. And then we can classify them all at once based on a scale such as one to five. From, from, from get it to great. Right? Everybody goes up. Everybody takes a pen. We don't need a whole lot of discussion. Right? We don't need to analyze. Just take a pen, walk up, and what does your gut feel about how good this option is? Right? This is real data. So status quo was actually pretty good. It was pretty OK. But there are some real, some people that have big problems with it, right? And we looked at all these options. And we actually didn't have option F yet. We looked at all these. People were like, hmm, hmm. And then someone said, wait a sec. How about, and then option F came. Option F came up after doing this. And everybody went up. And it turned out option F was, was superior. It's great. But in order to get there, we need to kind of look do this very, very gut feel type analysis. And once we look at this, well, OK, we can start analyzing a little bit more what it means. What this does, it basically it gives us uh, a faster route to finding what might be the right solution. And if it turns out to be wrong, if it turns out that this screws us up, oh wait, we can try another option later. right? So we have to pose these as, you know, you can't use the word experiment anymore. What am I supposed to use? We, we decided to do tries. <laughs> Help me, what's the word? Yeah, trials. Trials. Yeah. Or I say experiments and I go like this. <laughs> okay. So, um, yes, this one is a, a severely underrated, um, sometimes forgotten option. Just <coughs> do it. <laughs> if you have an idea, maybe it's easier to just do it right, if it's within your power and see what happens, right? And ask for forgiveness rather than permission. This takes a bit of courage but has been surprisingly effective in many cases. Um, example, do we really need to produce all these documents? And this is real life. This is a friend of mine who was a CTO at a gaming company in Sweden. They were producing a lot of documents for, for a, a regulatory reasons, because it's gambling systems and blah, blah. All these documents, release, release documents and stuff. Do we really need to produce them? And everybody, the managers were saying, yes, we have to because of blah, blah, blah. But their gut feeling was nobody uses them. So finally, he did the guerrilla thing. And he took the documents, such as configuration audit findings, took some of these documents, 
and he inserted a sentence in the middle of the document which says, if you see this wine, I'll buy you beer. <laughs> there was not much beer bought. Here. It's a good test, right? Just little things like that. Very funny. And then as they built up this bank of data of people not reading stuff, right? Or people not liking beer, who knows? Then they started telling his teams, if you're about to produce a document that you don't think anybody needs, don't produce it. Instead, put in a placeholder document with the same name. Uh -huh. right? And in it, it says, if you need this document, please email me and tell me why you need it and when. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll work my butt off. I'll work evenings, weekends, whatever, to get it to you. So that, that's, that's my side of the, of the deal, right? I'll make sure you get it. And of course, sometimes it turned out there were documents that did need, so they needed to work. Right? But on the whole, this eliminated a whole lot of waste. It's quite amazing. Yeah. So these are guerrilla techniques. You know, use with care. Don't sue me if it fails. <laughs> right. Only use guerrilla techniques when the other techniques, such as communication, are uh, fail. Here's another uh, real life example. Developers sitting there, testers sitting there. Uh, normally not a good idea. So, uh, but there was resistance. You know, this is a different organization, right? This is a test. They have a different manager, right? And this is, you know, how we work, right? You have to get permission from the CTO and from the blah, blah. Well, how about we just lift our butts and we lift our chairs and we just move, right? It'll take all of 10 minutes. When we bring the computers, it'll take another 20 minutes, right? We can do that really quickly. Just lift our butts and go over there and try it. And, and, and if it works well, we'll keep doing that until someone yells at us not to and we have a discussion, right? And that was quite, it was quite, it was a quite easy sell. I'm not trying to change the organization. I'm just saying, how about you come sit over here? Turns out that this is a good quote from Machiavelli. People do not truly believe in new things unless they've experienced them, right? So I'm not asking these people to believe that this is a good idea. I'm just saying, bear with me. You want to give it a try. If you don't like it, go right back again, right? Of course, it turned out that they loved it. So they stayed there. And actually, I was the manager of this organization. And it was funny because even a year later, Strict on paper, the organization was so that the testers are separate and the developers are here. But in the physical reality, they're sitting together. And guess what? It's the physical reality that counts, right? Not the organizational chart somewhere deep inside the wiki. All right. Um, these techniques don't always work, right? <laughs> or do they? I don't know. Do you have any examples? Anybody have an example of when one of these techniques has worked? Speak up. What? Current, current situation, visualizing you to the card ball, something or yeah. Any other tricks? Any of these things that you've tried yourself or yeah. working? Bringing right. documenting and stop doing what? it work. Like some of the things you talked about. Document. Yeah. You and just stop doing it, yeah, and it was okay. Yeah. Bringing everyone. In. Everyone into the room, just to talk about. Yeah. Breaking silos. What? Breaking silos. Breaking silos. How how did you do that? Uh, encouraging people to talk to each other. Yeah, encourage people. So you don't, you don't always have to move people physically. You can just organize a, 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 a coffee break, every, you know, coffee break, everybody right together. Sometimes stop emailing and call up. So you drew your deployment process, yeah. Right. Anybody examples of any of these techniques that have utterly backfired? Mm -hmm. Okay, some version of velocity metrics I didn't quite catch, but, but I'd like to hear someone who's backfired, tell us a backfire story, it didn't work, it failed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, recent example, just yesterday. Yesterday. So as the facilities, we want a new scrum room built. You want Immediately, scrum? yeah. yeah. Immediately, the response was, your business unit has taken up this, 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 and this conference room. We can't give you any more room. We uh, don't have much yet. So, so, so you got to know. Right? So what are you going to do next? Uh, well, I went on a hire, and I went to his boss. You can escalate, yeah? Yeah. I went to his boss and said, look, we really need this. Yeah. It affects our team. It affects our productivity. Yeah. And then he got the dialogue started. Hey, uh, we'll get somebody else to talk to you. We'll get somebody uh, to talk to you. Yeah, so can you talk on Friday? Okay, so, so that's available. Available. okay. Yeah, I'm not available on Friday, so Monday. So okay. Monday, I'll know So what the I first attempt backfired, you talk. Yep. Here's a good metaphor. Um, 
I like silly metaphors. <laughs> think of your team, or think of a river, okay? Think of a river flowing. And, and your team doing its work is this river flowing, right? You're trying to get to some destination. Now, suppose there's a rock in the middle of the river. What does the flowing river try to do with the rock? When it encounters the rock? By the it, What does it try to do first? It tries to push it away. You put it on a small rock, it's going to get pushed away, right? That's your scrub master, that's your team just saying, it doesn't work. You tried everything, it doesn't work, right? So what might that mean? tried everything to get the organization to improve on some aspect and it just doesn't work. What does that mean? What? Maybe they don't want to change, right? Maybe they want to be the way they are. And maybe it's just too difficult, right? So there's always the option of doing what? This is law of two feet, right? I mean, you only have so many years of your life, right? The law of two feet doesn't just apply in open space, it applies to life. It can move, right? It can be scary. But if you know things are bad here, you move, right? What's the worst that can happen? It might be bad here as well when you move again, right? So law of two feet. If you really can't change your environment, <laughs> use your two feet to find a new environment. There are plenty of really cool agile companies here in Bangalore as well. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I visited one today. It's really cool. What? <laughs> Am I allowed to say it? Are you in here? Yeah. Walmart was pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay, so you can always change yourself once again, even if that means using your two feet to go somewhere else, right? So I think that leaves me time for a personal story, because um, I have an hour, right, until 5.30? Um, <coughs> this was uh, 2010, um, I think, I had this dilemma, uh, I like traveling, but I don't like being away from my family. That sounds familiar. So wait a sec. It took me way too long to realize that. Wait a sec. There is a solution to this problem. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just thinking, yeah. it, 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 this was a background thing. Right? I have four small kids in there. There's a school and stuff. So I didn't really think beyond this. This is a problem. I should travel less. But then at one point I was talking to my wife. And we we're like, if we could do whatever we want. Which is a good question to ask sometimes. If we could do whatever we want, what would we do? And we're like, it'd be really cool to just travel with the kids. Because I was like seeing all these cool places in the world and I wanted to share that. But this would be really cool. And the first thing that popped out of our mouths were, but we can't because. Exactly what I told you not to do is exactly what we did. We can't because. I mean, it seems very natural. We can't because we don't have time. Because we can't take kids out of school. Because of work commitments. Because traveling with kids must be impossible. Uh, and what about my bands? I play music. I play bands. What are they going to do without the basis? Or well, what about the hamster or the house? Just, just no end of excuses for not traveling. Um, so, but then I realized, wait a sec, wait, wait, what, what are we doing? We can't be listing up all the reasons we can't. We have to turn this around and say, well, what would it take to make this happen? And, you know, do we want to do this? Yes. But we can't because, wait, no, no. If we could, what would it take? So all of the I can'ts turned into actions, things we have to do, right? In some cases, so agreement from the family, we have to check, you know, do the kids want us to do this actually? Um, and and uh, we need to set a date, otherwise we'll never get out. And then there's after work less. I can't be traveling all over the world with the family and trying to work all the time. It won't work. And, and what well, schooling? It's like, how do we do that? I mean, we have no idea. So all of these things became, you know, things to do, right? And this model turned out to be useful. Just this way of thinking, right? Once again, the goal: Why on earth would we want to travel? What is the what is the point, right? And we had several reasons. I mean, it would, we would be together as a family. Uh, we could see new things together, have fun together. It would be a break from the daily routines. We had this list of, of whys. Um, and then understanding the current situation, right? What is it about the current situation that makes us want to travel? Because maybe we could achieve that goal in an easier way. Is it just work less? Well, don't need to travel to work less, right? Maybe I can solve that problem instead, right? So we looked at that. We concluded that, yeah, but we actually do want to travel. There are some things we want to achieve by traveling that we're not getting today. And then there are a number of concrete steps and how would we measure progress. Well, it turned out that, well, here's our board. <laughs> uh, that's the vision. What we did was we went to, to Google Images, which is cool. All we sat together and the kids were like, how would we like the photo album to look like when we get back from the trip? We just pretend we already did the trip. It's already finished. We came back. What kind of stuff would we like to see? And we're all Googling around. Course, the one-year-old didn't know Google yet, but the other. <laughs> and there's, you know, there's elephants and there's sailing boats and there's a double-decker bus and there's birds on a, on a, on a, on a 
plaza and you know, fun, and water and all kinds of stuff came out. This is not a backlog. <laughs> this is a vision. There's a different. <laughs> <laughs> this is the backlog. This is the stuff we want to do to achieve this. Never confuse uh, outcome with output, right? Yeah. This would correspond to the, your, the stuff you're delivering, the features you're building. This is the impact you're achieving, right? Different between them. Right, um, there's a motive, what, why we're doing this in the first place, because we, we, we want to keep that in mind all the time, right? Because sometimes we have to make decisions. Um, there is a date constraint we decided we leave on the 1st of October, which was 10 months, 11 months in the future, something like that. Um, just that uh, we leave, that, that, that's our fixed date. Everything else is variable scope, right? Fixed date, variable scope. We don't know exactly which countries, we don't know uh, how long we're going to be traveling, etc. So um, it turned out it, at the end to be a six month trip, and it took, took us to eight countries. Took us through, uh, it took, took us through uh, Denmark, China, Japan, uh, Thailand, New Zealand, Peru, and Brazil, and, and the West Indies. And all kinds of things here and here helped us decide which countries, in which order, how long time in each country, etc. And what's, what's here is uh, to do, right? This stuff is stuff that we have to do or there is no trip, right? We have to get flight tickets. We have to figure out a solution with school. We have to figure that out, right? So these, these are the must-haves, right? These are the should have. We really, really want to get these things done, right? We, we would really like to rent out the house as we leave. Otherwise, the trip's going to be very expensive. We might afford it, right? Rent out the house, get some cash, um, etc. And these are the you know bonus things. Like we should, we should you know uh, clear out the basement and all these stupid things we'll never do. But for some reason, people want to put them on lists, right? It's weird. So we did that. We had all these things done the other way. It'd be nice to do this. We kind of thought we would do it, but we didn't do it. Yes, anyone. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. Human nature. Yeah, this would be the next one. What are the next ones we're going to do? And you know, some of these have lead times. We can't do them all. We can't strictly do them in priority order. There's sometimes other aspects that influence the order. So we did a few of these, a few of these, and one of those. Um, this is what's ongoing. Natural width limit in the form of how big is the, is the, is the square, right? Um, and then uh, dump, right? So that. This is pretty much the, 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 how this model looked like in practice. And this was in, in, at home, on the wall. So you walked by it every day. Got reminded every day of stuff we have to do to make this trip happen. And over here, you can't see it, I guess, but you can. Yeah, there's a little arrow, right? I think it's in the wrong place. It's over here. Kids moved it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it was here. Yeah, the, the, day, the day was down here. Here was the deadline. So we were actually over here, right? Moved like that. And here you see the different countries for me, right? So the arrow moves, and that's a good daily reminder too. Like, oh shit, you know, the date's not going to move. We've decided that. That's fixed. The arrow moves, and here's our scope, right? So the kids like that to move the arrows. All right. We, uh, one of the things we realized was a fear was one of the impediments. Like, we don't know. There's, there's all these things we don't know, right, that you have to think about when traveling with kids. We hadn't really done that before. So one of the notes here on the must was do a spike, right? Travel spike. So we did a short trip. Just a three-day trip to London. Visit some friends. You know, a three-day trip, but you know, with, with, with four kids, with, with, the, with the right, the, the type of stuff that we would bring on the long trip, to check, you know, can they carry their own stuff? Can they do that? Uh, will the baby hate flying in the plane? Who knows? Uh, what type of baby carriage do we need? All these little things we need to figure out. So we did that trip, came back with a broken baby carriage, realized we have to get another baby carriage. <laughs> things like that. Very, very useful, right? Anyway, uh, and th that was it. This was very, very helpful. And it helped us get out, really. And we had a wonderful trip. So, Whatever your goal is, whatever it is you want to do, but, I mean, people have different goals, they have different constraints. Uh, there's probably stuff you want to do, which may not be this, but whatever it is, I can recommend this way of thinking, right, this model. Uh, where do, what is it we want if we can do whatever, whatever we want? Why do we want that? Where are we now, right? What are the concrete steps we can do to get there? How do we measure progress? And for Christ's sake, stop saying we can't because. Okay, wrap up. Um, Here's the stuff, the takeaway points from this, right? Um, change starts with you. That's where it starts. Don't wait for someone else to do something. Um, don't change other people, right? Motivate people to change themselves. And to do that, you need to be careful. To give them a reason to change. Well, why would they want to change, right? What is the reason? So visualization helps. Um, show them a way, small, clear steps, right? Show them a way. Sometimes you don't know the way, so you have to talk together to figure out the way, right? But and support, encouragement, feedback, right? This is what good managers do when they want to evolve the organization, right? Support, encouragement, feedback, and these things. Um, 
and it's hopeful it will help as, as some kind of level. I think that's it. I think that's all I have about change. We have a few minutes. Uh, any questions? What? It was really a pain carrying the scrum board. <laughs> we realized that next trip we're not going to carry the scrum board. <laughs> yeah. The purpose of that board was to get us on the plane and out, so we didn't need it afterwards. Any other questions? I, su I suggest we do this because the room is hot, so we will all move on. Uh, I'll be around here for discussion. Um, thanks for coming. This was interesting.